anxious to step through the gate again, Major? Yes, I am. We all are. Would you like us to bring back anything special? Uh, no, thanks. Groceries, new outfit, flatware? Hmm. No. Just yourselves in one piece, please. Dial it up. You safe. the Jumping Pedals podcast. Be sure to listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and or YouTube. And follow us at Jumping Pedals Podcast on Tumblr and Instagram and Jumping Pud Pod on Twitter. And if you want to support our podcast, please check out our coffee. Hi, I'm Sam, and with me are my fellow co-hosts, Tor and Ash. Hey! Hi! And this week we're talking about the Season 2 episode, The Long Goodbye. After recovering two life pods, Elizabeth Weir is implanted with a consciousness of one of the dying occupants of the pods. She asks Shepard to allow her husband to enter his mind so they could say goodbye, but instead of a last loving reunion, they attempt to kill each other, revealing that they are the last of their people and intend to win a war that was over ages ago. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Damn, yeah, that was a we're good rusty, we're rusty right That was a good summary though. Oh my goodness. Thank you. I it's liked off it. my own. <laughs> the flavor, the spice. Mm. Excellent. Like this episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm really curious about this episode and like on our um about our re- reactions on it because I love it. But I'm not sure about you guys. <laughs> Oh yeah, I think it's fun. It's like the most fun romp. Uh, I just think the 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 comedy straight out the gate in the beginning of the episode is, is so funny, and then you get awesome action with a character who doesn't get action scenes normally. So it's kind of a fun little change of pace for our people. Also, it's a bottle episode, which I love. Those episodes that take place just on Atlantis. Yeah. Um, it's a- <laughs> <laughs> uh, I look like I'm Al I look like I'm in the minority of this one. Um listen, I see the appeal and I think some of it works for me, but I also think some of it doesn't. So it's kind of just another one of these episodes that I'm just gonna go. It's an episode. Um <laughs> <laughs> I, feel like, yeah. I, really saw, I feel like behind the scenes as well that kind of just pissed me off about this episode mm. and sort of things that we've been talking about that I think are sort of tied into this episode that I don't know if I don't remember how I felt about it the first time I think I also was just like it's an episode and I, so I was kind of hoping I would go in and like see if like it would change but I feel like it kind of stayed the same for me Th- there's things I like there's things I don't like so yeah. I'm excited. I think for me it's just yeah. I think for me it's just like it's just for me it's so fun to watch. It's just like I'm just having a good time when I watch it. And <laughs> I think there's probably a lot to criticize about it, but meh. in this case I don't really care about it because I just enjoy watching it. <laughs> for basically the same reason that Toa already mentioned, yeah. <laughs> where do we even begin? I mean, where do you even start? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that I think Star- uh, Atlantis has the funniest opening scenes, like the cold openings. They So often it's just a team just like talking about whatever. And I think every time it's so funny. And then this time, in this case as well, when um, they're just talking about TV and that like the entirety of Earth people just are like glued to the screens. Um, and I was like, yeah. People do just watch a box for hours a day. Um, yeah, people do that. Rogan kind of gagged us all there. Like, <laughs> damn, when you put it like that, we sound silly as hell. Like, yeah, we do watch a box. Like, okay. And then we do podcasts also... about the things in the box. <laughs> yeah. Rodan would look at us with such contempt if he knew. <laughs> He'd be like, oh my god, you guys are nerds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we are. Yeah. It's interesting because it kind of confirms that 
Um, so Tita didn't have a, like, TV equivalent. It makes sense to me that Taylor's people wouldn't have a TV because they were a very, like, uh, rural, living off the land society. But then Ronan came from, like, futuristic city place. Well, at least an industrial place. So they didn't have TV. And maybe they did, like, the old school entertainment, like, theaters and, like, plays and stuff. And that's why he's so into poetry instead of it being modernized with, like, the TV. A hundred percent. I feel like that's always a thing in fic, where, like, Ronan's just, like, a huge theater kid, <laughs> because that's what they did on Satina. And then, like, there's a bunch of jokes that come with that, obviously. Um, and I do want to mention, too, um, it's such a fun kind of tie-in to one of my favorite deleted scenes, which I hate that I got deleted from Miller's Crossing? Is that the one where... Rodney gets kidnapped. Okay, yeah, Miller's cross. There's everyone needs to go look it up on YouTube. One of the, my favorite deleted scenes. Every deleted scene is like honestly just evil because it's just usually amazing. Um, it's a scene of Ronan and John at the motel, and Ronan is watching Battlestar Galactica because it's on TV. And Ronan's like, "Dude, we gotta go help these people." Like. They need our help. Like, this is really happening. And John's like, no, 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 no. Like, they're acting. And Ron's like, but you told me everything on the TV is true. And John's like, no, 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 no. And then they get called away to go, yeah, I don't know, find Rodney. Um, Just one of my favorite things. And I feel like it ties in, would have tied in perfectly to sort of this scene where he's like, you guys watch a box for fun. Um, so, yeah, I always get so sad that it was deleted. But it's, it's a great one. That is criminal. I I have forgotten about that scene, but it's criminal that they that they deleted that. It's so yeah, cute. They... It showcases Ronan's cuteness and like the the earth naivety so so well and in such a wholesome way. I really love that. I just really yeah. like the trope of Rodney and John trying to explain Earth things to Taylor and Ronan, and then kind of realizing. From their perspective, Earth stuff is so bizarre. And I like that, like, subversion of the trope. Like, the human things are more alien to the aliens than anything the aliens do <laughs> to the humans. So, yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. great. I just love Taylor and Ronan just... I don't even know if they look at each other in this scene, but them just, like, rolling their eyes and be like, what the fuck is happening? Why, Why are we friends with these people? <laughs> Uh, yeah, they're like, God, these are the humans we have to protect. Are these the humans that are protecting us? These are the guys that are saving our galaxy. Like, God damn it. Like, we really went down bad. And I was going to say, I also just feel like the intro is like a sad reminder that we never got an episode of all four of the gang just like on Earth, like doing Earth things. That will always kill me inside. I needed Taylor, Ronan, Rodney, and John to go on, like, a road trip. And <laughs> John and Rodney having to explain, like, gas stations or, like, dog parks. Like, I really needed that interaction. So, sad. But at least we got this little snippet. I wanted to go to a football game. Like, American football? Wait, sorry. American yeah, football. yeah, sorry. American football. Okay. No, no, no. I'm just... No, no, no. I just... I love that I had to clarify that now. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I would like Ronan would love it. Like yes. tailgating, like doing the whole beer thing, like, you know, putting on the cheesy t shirts and going to like the local college game. And Taylor would love it too. Are you kidding me? Taylor would be like the life of the party. Everyone would be like, oh my God, like she's that cool girl. I think she would like, I feel like the first time it would be a little bit bizarre for her, but. She would totally get into the things. Oh, yeah. She'd, like, arm wrestle when she's, like, drunk enough, and everyone would be like, yeah. Oh, my God. It kinda, they, they gotta take Elizabeth, too, right? So she's oh, there, yeah. too. And, like, someone, someone is making a comment about Elizabeth or something, and Taylor's just like, nah, dude, you messed with the wrong girl. <laughs> Either Rodney or Zelenka is definitely wearing, like, an apron and that's just, like, kiss the chef or something and, like is the one grilling everything oh wow um, yeah we missed that anyways this episode the intro scene. <laughs> well, you know, back to the episode yeah the intro scene is 
always fun. Sorry, I'm just adding some uh, road trip fix to the fit corner because I was like, oh shit, I should add some. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Yes, I oh, got yes. tons. Yeah. There's tons. Oh, oh, I don't know how to Damn. get this down. <laughs> You're working quick. Oh, <laughs> Seriously, thank you for your hard work. Yeah. I got you. You know I got you. I can find like a smooth transition that's just not working. Okay, so uh, Caldwell. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, hey, we got some continuity. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I completely forgot that this is there, so that's nice. Yeah, I think it's really good that they show for like, um, not only that they mention it like in the beginning, uh, with Elizabeth that he like he has some trust to regain, um, but that it's actually an issue throughout the episode, at least with Rodney. Um, so I. Wow, they actually work you through some stuff here. And by the way, um, this has to do with my like recent finishing the X Files again. It happened yeah. <laughs> finally. I don't know that my image of Caldwell has kind of been overwritten by my image of Skinner from X Files. Oh. So when I watch, uh, when I watch Stargate now, I kind of see Skinner in Caldwell, and it's a little bit confusing. But um. <laughs> Yeah. I know it's That's hard. It happen. I was like obsessed with Skinner when I watched the X Files. Like he was my favorite character, oddly enough. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. um I really do like that first scene with Elizabeth and Caldwell though. Uh when she's up in her office and he comes in and he's kinda like I like he seems kind of I don't want to say sad, but, you know, he's kind of telling her, like, okay, like, after we gain, you know, the trust here, like, I understand, like, I'm here to put in the work. And I like that she sort of, like, just offers him an olive branch, and she's like, calm down, see what we found out, you know? And I like that, um, I don't know, it just shows, I think, how understanding Elizabeth can be. I was going to say forgiving as well, but I think she realizes that, you know, it just wasn't really his fault. And I think, you know, it's kind of a... A little nod, I think, at all the people that, like, I don't know, I feel like people would have gotten on her ass if she tried to be, like, super hard and tough about it. Um, people would have found another reason to hate her for that. So I like that she was just like, no, like, just come down and, like, join us over here. And he was like, okay. And, um, yeah, I love that little scene, too, when he goes down and <laughs> John perceives him, and John's just kind of like, if you can see it, like, on the side, and he's kind of looking at him and, like, crossing his arms, like, kind of freaked out. Like, oh my god, I think he still has, like, the thing inside of him. And again, where Rodney was just, like, working on, like, the pod or whatever, and he doesn't even notice Caldwell, and he totally pops out, and then he's like, oh, and then he gets weird, too, and he's like, oh. I just love everyone's reactions are just so, like, oh, you're here again. <laughs> yeah. It's also so funny, because I think until we recorded critical mass i never really realized that they didn't like that the team didn't realize that caldwell was the ghoul and that they were just suspecting caldwell like caldwell the person so it's like oh oh okay so they really 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 don't trust him but not because he was a ghoul but because like they just don't like him i guess this just kind of brings up how how long has caldwell been possessed and uh do they, can they trust him? Have they ever trusted him? Have they ever, when they trusted him, was he himself or was he just the ghoul playing along? Yeah, I think they do like a semi decent job at like resolving some things between Caldwell and like the team. But on the other hand, again, I just feel like there's still so many questions. Yeah, like how exactly, like how long was he, you know? taken over and I, I guess because the gold can like access the memories i guess it makes sense why he's kind of like acts the same but it just kind of feels like you know they had a little awkwardness which i appreciate and they were kind of like all right then we're good and they're just gonna move past it forever and i'm kind of like no i want to wait <laughs> there's so much left unsaid um but i appreciate that it was at least a little weird just in the beginning it wasn't just like always forgiven you're cool um and I think in later seasons, um, with how Caldwell kind of pops up to save their asses again, I think, you know, 
there's definitely going to be a point where they're like, all right, we trust you because you just keep saving us <laughs> instead of act- actively working against us. So. so he has such a crush on Elizabeth. I'm imagining everyone having a crush on Elizabeth because I have a crush on Elizabeth, but I generally think that he has a crush on Elizabeth. Yeah. I feel like this episode is when I was like, okay, I definitely think he has a crush on her. A little. I mean, because to be honest, I feel like he's always trying to like ask her out, or he's always like, let's get a beer after like work or something. I feel like in this episode, he was like, I think, you know, it could be taken as like, oh, he's just trying to like, re- like you know, mend things. But I also just feel like Elizabeth forgave him so quickly that like all of that wasn't necessary. <laughs> like the way he was looking at her sometimes it was just like he was just being like so like on her side, like kind of a little kiss assy a little, I think, because he just wanted to, you know, like fix things. Um, but because it wasn't because it looked like he made it so clear in the beginning, like, no, you're fine. I think that's when I was like, OK, that's fine. It's like a crush thing then. Yeah, I, don't remember what... I saw it more this episode. Yeah. I don't remember what it was in the first scene, but I think it was just like when she she asked him to to join them. It I think it was something about the way he like smiled, like in relief, or maybe just looking at her. I was like, "Those are hard eyes." <laughs> I was gonna mention something about Caldwell before we transition. Uh, I, sure. I just wanted to m- mention, like, I I felt. I felt I see the evidence of the Caldwell crush on Elizabeth because that one scene where um, John and Elizabeth are kissing, he was so like sad looking and dejected. And I was like, oh no, Caldwell. <laughs> and like um, when they were like, oh, wait, we can clear the room and like give you guys a moment uh, alone. And he was like, no. And Rodney was like, yo, like chill out. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. Also, that's true. I feel like Rodney is a secret romantic. Like he, I feel like he's kind of teasing John a little bit about, um, you know, volunteering or being voluntold for this little um, imprinting session. Uh, and his smirk <laughs> was a little bit smarmy, um, but also his reaction to the kiss was like, "Oh, like this is sweet." Um, even though it's kind of weird. So I feel like in his heart of hearts, he's a, he's a closet romantic. Well, I guess let's just jump into that scene, actually. So I feel like there's so much to discuss there, but I want to piggyback off of that. And I feel like, what was it? Oh, there's one thing that I was like, um, yeah, that kiss when they're kissing and, you know, they're saying like, oh, we want our own room. And Colo's like, no. And Rodney goes, they're two consenting adults. Obviously, at this point, they don't know that, like, uh, it's just, like, the alien entity and not, like, Elizabeth and John, right? I think it's, like, they think it's, like, a, like, they, they can share it or, like, they're okay. But when he said that, I was, like, again, he gets a free pass, so obviously, we didn't know. But I was, like, oh, this is no consent there. And I don't know why it gave me, like, universe, like, horror flashbacks yeah. to all those stupid yeah body swap shenanigans mm-hmm. that they really they stopped doing after like the first half of season one because people were just so weirded out by it which was real um and so yeah i hated that and then the whole like hopeless romantic thing i just wanted to stop for a moment and be like do we really think john is a hopeless romantic <laughs> Because I got the impression that he was just doing it because Elizabeth asked him. And they were like, oh, like, no, you're a hopeless romantic. And John looks so disgusted. <laughs> I'm not disgusted, but he just looks so, like, in shock that anyone would ever call him a hopeless romantic. And I was like, you guys are all misreading the situation, okay? Like, he was just generally like, okay, yeah, I'll do it because Elizabeth asked. And because, I don't know, like, he's nice like that. But I thought that scene was whole. The scene was really funny, especially because Carson was also kind of pushing the whole, like, man, take and John's over in the corner, like, I don't want to do this. Yeah, I think it was interesting in a way, um, because uh, there was that whole scene before it where uh, Elizabeth is trying to describe the experience, uh, like, the feelings of quote-unquote love that Phoebus had for, uh, what's his name? Thalen? Yeah. Um, and 
John says something like, oh, I can imagine. And Rodney's like, no, you can't. And then John's like, no, I can't. Because, I don't know, that exchange is just my favorite and I think um, explains John to a T because I don't think John and romantic feelings are so, like, incongruous. Like, I, like he just, he has such a weird way of um, portraying emotion, which I think is, like, a mix of John's dialogue as it's written as well as Joe's performance. Um, and so... I just think it was really funny, Rodney being so adamant, like, John, you've never felt romantic love in your life. And John being like, yeah, you're right. Uh, <laughs> which is remarkably sad because he was married. Um, so it was kind of weird. Fancy. Yeah, it was also a very strange moment, but also like a very John allergic to feelings moment. And I think his uncomfortableness... Um, with the whole imprinting situation had to do with, um, his, you know, allergic to feelingsness <laughs> as well. I thought that that exchange about, like, no, you can't imagine what it's like was about, um, that Elizabeth said it's kind of like, it's kind of like a rush having another presence in your body or like another consciousness and then John is like oh I can imagine another one he's like no I thought that was because Rodney was referring to him having Catman stuck in his head True. and being like no John you have no idea what it's like to have another consciousness in your body and then John is like oh yeah right you're, you're right or not because I that I had another consciousness stuck in my body so I thought that was in reference to that True. but I mean it doesn't negate what, everything that you have been say, saying. <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't even realize. That's true. She, she did say that. Both work. And I feel like both add so much to both, like, both John's character and like Rodney's character. I feel like they're, they're just so telling. You know, to each their own of which version you want to believe. Or both, honestly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I yeah, think- John was definitely uncomfortable with the whole imprinting things. And like, I don't... I, Maybe it was because of, like, he was afraid of the emotions of another person. <laughs> um, or just the whole, I actually don't really want to give up my body to another consciousness, because that's a very weird concept. Absolutely. Um, um, very frightening. And it, it also made me think of, like, the communication stones in universe and... To go back what you just earlier said, Sam, about the like the whole consent thing. Yeah, first of all, Elizabeth didn't give consent to actually like have this other person in her body. Like the the consciousness gave would give consent, but like the bodies are not there, so yeah, that's a thing. I feel like uncomfortableness on another level for John in the terms of like Okay, we're 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 taking on these consciousness of these married people and like I have to continue to work with you in a professional setting um after whatever is going to happen is going to happen. And so like in his mind, I think he knows that Elizabeth was like for it, but at the same time well he thought Elizabeth was for it because they had that conversation in the hospital. Um but at the same time, it's like, oh, God, like, what is going to happen when my body is out of my control? Like, like you're saying, Ash, it's like a very scary, giving up your autonomy um, is very scary, especially, <laughs> especially in that instance. It's where, like, control issues. Yeah, when you know, like, the nature of their relationship. Um, yeah. So, just as a layer of poor John. Uh, <laughs> an awkward um office drama to it, which is great. <laughs> yeah, I also think just like the whole sequence of like them like trying to push John like closer and closer to the pod was just so hilarious, and he's just so out of it. I also think this is probably a strong episode for like the asexual John agenda. I think that's. That might be this might be one of the strongest episodes I think so far. Where I'm like, okay, I really see it. Like the way they were like 
having to shove John towards this pod. Obviously, like, you know, it could be for other reasons as well, like, the, you know, the whole consent thing and, like, giving up control. Um, but I was just watching it and I was like, oh, like, it clicked for me. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I really see it here. I was like, okay, it makes sense. Um, yes, yeah, so I just thought it was kind of a mix of, mo- mix of emotions <laughs> from that scene. I do love, um, everyone's reaction to Elizabeth getting imprinted, like, uh, Rodney's like, Elizabeth, which is, like, nice. I like to see him worrying about her, too, in, like, the clinic. Um, I thought that was really sweet. I also thought it was really funny, um, that Phoebus was really adamant about John being the one, uh, to be imprinted with Thalen and not anybody else. I was like, there's four other dudes in the room and you're picking this one guy? Like, why? (laughs) I want to know what the reason is. I mean, I guess, like, coming from a sparky, like, John Elizabeth Shipper background, probably the reasoning from them would be that Phoebus notices some tendencies in Elizabeth and that's why she chose him. Maybe Phoebus just thought that John was hot. (laughs) Maybe it was completely self-serving. I don't know. Either way, very funny. Yeah. Her playing matchmaker. It was also... Or her (laughs) thinking John was hot. Either way, it's hilarious. (laughs) Either way, playing matchmaker, that was so funny, though, because then she's just being extra mean to Elizabeth, because then she's like, I'm going to kill the guy you Oh, you like. <laughs> so it's sort of funny in a way that's like, it's not that, it's just like, is it just evil? Like, it's more sinister, I think, when you think about it like that. It's like, it's not, I mean, it's, in a way, yeah. it's also, it's like extra sinister, because like, she really could have picked like Rodney or someone, or like someone who like didn't have a military background, and then she could have killed him easily. But I'm thinking maybe she just wanted more of a challenge. I wanted someone who could sort of fight back. I think she wanted someone that she could beat and be like, okay, I feel proud that like I beat him and he's still in like, you know, a military body. <laughs> yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, actually. Because it is weird that she chose. Yeah, she basically chose the person she wanted to kill later. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, it's not like I don't think, like, she could maybe have, like, sense it was with, like, feelings or something, but I just feel like that adds, like, such a layer of, like, evilness to her that I just feel like this doesn't exist in the episode. I feel like she's just very much, like, do not care, I just want to kill this guy. So I feel like it makes more sense for, me, for her to be like, hmm, who would, like, actually give me a fight, mm-hmm. and, you know, and, like, you. Oh. It's interesting you say that, too, because, um... Caldwell, although he was a little um, sad about the situation, he was funny because he was like, maybe we shouldn't arm the aliens, so you should give me your firearm, John. Like, he, it's like he kind of intuited what you were saying, Sam, and was like, oh, let me disarm you before something terrible happens, you know, just in case. So I appreciate um, them trying to make Caldwell a little bit more sympathetic after all, like, the bullshit that happened um, before by making him sort of smart. Although I didn't particularly like the way he treated Carson and Rodney uh, later on in the episode, but we can talk about that after. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, though, um, I mean, this is kind of, I this is one thing that the episode it's just, again, like, they were just so trusting. Yeah. They were so, like, I don't know. And again, I think um, in that Reddit post that Jim Malazzi made one time, he was talking about how, like, if, you know, they would have, you know, there are things they wanted to change. And they sort of, wanted, that was one of the things where they were like, oh, it should have been, like, Elizabeth and John in the beginning. That, like, um, like the pods should have been both there, and it should have both just been like accidentally. Uh-huh. That would kind of you know explain it away, um, because they were so trusting. And like, not that I'm saying that like Phoebus didn't do like a good job sort of acting like Elizabeth, because I think she, for the most part she did. But I was like, okay, is no one noticing how happy Elizabeth is? Like she's too giddy. She's like a schoolgirl. I was like, guys, yeah, 
I was like, she's way too quirky. She's no, this is <laughs> it's nobody noticing how much she's smiling. That is not normal for Elizabeth. She doesn't do that. <laughs> we just took her at face value, and they're like, "All right, free reign. You're gonna, we're just gonna bring in some aliens." Like, come, oh, yeah. oh my god, like, if anything, they should have like, you know, like if they really wanted to be nice, like should have thrown them in like a jail cell <laughs> i've been like all right you guys can be here together for like the remainder of your life but like you're gonna be under watch or something or like in a room and not a jail cell but like in a room or something that had like guards and cameras or whatever um but they were just willy-nilly like yeah we'll revive your dead husband sure why not yeah also do you like something i couldn't figure out is were they actually married? Or was it just something that Elizabeth said to make them, like, revive him? Because I think it's mentioned later again um, that they are married. I'm like, I, 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 are you? I don't get it. I don't think so. they are. Yeah, I think. I think it was part of their ploy to, like, get the, them to, like, together. Because I think. Yeah, right? I think so, because they were like, oh, these people are so naive, like, they'll they'll have a bleeding heart if we say, like, we're, you know, married, so I'm just going to pretend like he's my husband so I can actually kill him. Because if I say, like, oh, he murdered my people, they're not going to let me kill him, so I might as well just, I feel like probably that was why. I think, I think, because then... You're right, she does bring it out. Like, Phoebus says it again, like, she's like, oh, husband, or whatever, when they're fighting. Um, but I think she was, like, saying it mockingly, and not actually okay. yeah. meaning it. Mm-hmm. I think. I honestly wish they had stuck with, like, the marriage, like, gimmick thing, because I feel like it would have added an extra layer of, yeah. like, silliness. Not to, I don't want to turn this into the, you know, but I don't know, I didn't really find this episode as, like, silly as it could be. And I don't know why, like, that made me kind of mad. I feel like it was a little too action-y. Like, there were some parts where I was like, oh, this is good, this is good. But I kind of wish they had, like, played it up fully as sort of, like, yeah, they're this married couple that hates each other. Um, and it would have been just, like, them actually trying to kill each other. And, like, I don't know. It, it like, it could have been funnier. I just feel like the humor was missing in a lot of these scenes. It was a lot of, it was way more serious than I think I wanted. Yeah, I can see that. It would have been funny. I mean, it, it could have in both like yeah if you like if you're going to for your comedy then yes they should have just been married and just like be at each other's <laughs> throat for decades i don't know but it could have been a marriage of like oh uh, maybe that would have been more tragic than if they were like from two different um peoples and uh like then got married but then they were like no we still hate each other yeah, I guess you have a point in that I feel like Rodney's joke like about oh like you guys need serious marriage counseling and like um Carson being like they're headed for divorce, like those jokes would land even harder. Like I was already laughing, but I feel like if they were actually married then it probably would have been even funnier if um it was real. So yeah, I, I, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah. For sure. I think because I'm this is sort of like a, you know, I think people complain about it, and I think I'm usually not on their side, but I think for this episode I am. You know, people complain that sometimes, like, Atlantis is too serious, right? Um, or what I've heard is, like, it's too, not dark, but, like, it's too serious sometimes. And I think, you know, I would have preferred a little more, like, yeah, silliness and humor just in the overall show. I think that's why I do like irresistible which i know everyone hates um because it is a bad episode yes but i just like that they committed to the bit and it's just a very silly episode that like everyone is out of you know act, acting out of character and so i think it would have been fun to bring some of that more in the show and i think yeah like what Tor said like mentioning you know rodney mentioning um marriage counseling and uh carson bringing up divorce i think it would have been really fun too if um if it was sort of like a they you know they got married they used to love each other and they hated each other but then i also think it'd be fun if like they you know were actually still trying to kill each other like maybe like john accidentally gets injured 
and Phoebus is like, oh my god, are you okay? And they have some sort of like, oh no, like I didn't mean to hurt you here or something. And then, you know, they sort of like resolve it in the end. And it's just sort of like a back and forth of like love and hate. I think it would have been really funny because the whole team would have been sick of them by the end and it would have been like, oh my god, pick a side, love or hate, please. Um, so I think that would have been a really fun sort of dynamic to explore, especially to explore within John and Elizabeth too. A sort of this like they kind of have some some similarities between like the whole like love and hate thing, right? They go from like being really good coworkers sometimes to absolutely despising each other when John inevitably really fucks up and like does something that Elizabeth is just like, "What the fuck is your <laughs> like?" No, you have to listen to me. Yeah, I feel like there could have been some fun sort of parallels. Um, that was long. But yeah, anyways, whatever. <laughs> no, no, I think you have a point and it could, it would have been funny. I wanted to say, like, oh, in the end they would just, like, yeah, be so sick of them and just, like, send them to another planet to um hash things out. And then I realized, oh, wait, they can't because they are still in John and Elizabeth's body. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! I thought, oh, could they maybe upload them, like, into the cloud or something? <laughs> um, yeah. And have them just, like, hanging there in like a little corner of the like memory memory space of Atlantis and they just incorporeal fights and like every few weeks they check in and oh they like each other right now and then oh they hate each other right now oh I love that I was thinking sort of like trying to incorporate the hospital scene still I thought it'd be funny if like John Elizabeth like still wake up but if they're on opposite sides of the room and they're like handcuffed to the bed, <laughs> and this was like, what happened? And John's like, I don't know. And I have to explain, like, yeah, you guys were like either throwing shit at each other or like trying to make out. So we just like got tired of you and just like <laughs> tied you to the bed. And I think, ooh, I don't know, I think it would have been so fun. I like that the action was a little bit silly at the same time, though, in some moments, like, Right at the beginning when um, they first start shooting at each other in the room. And everyone's like, doesn't know what to do. <laughs> it's so funny to me when uh, Rodney is just shooting right at John. Like, literally trying to shoot him. And Carson is like, Rodney, you realize, like, that is John in there, right? Like, <laughs> that's his body that you're shooting at? It was so funny. And also... Um, dangerous because Rodney um, dropping the gun without putting the safety on and you could hear it like clattering on the ground I was like bro that gun I'm surprised it didn't go off and shoot Carson right in the leg because that was not proper gun safety oh my god he was he was so uncomfortable taking the gun in the first place as well he was like uh, how do we hold that thing I don't like this and then yeah Rodney what the fuck what was what did your, like, 200 IQ brain do right now? <laughs> what happened? Thinking on the fly is just not his strong suit. <laughs> um, Honestly relatable. Um, I was going to say, though, that little scene of John giving his sidearm, I was like, oh, I was like, there's layers to this. I was like, not to psychoanalyze and go way like, in depth, but I was like, that just that shot of him passing his sidearm to Rodney, I was like, you could write an essay on that. <laughs> and what that represents for their relationship. I was like, I'm too crazy. Um, <laughs> I think yeah, do Rodney it? shooting John. <laughs> Who wants it? Let me know. <laughs> ha, me. I'll do it if someone asks. No. <laughs> um, yeah, and then Rodney shooting John. Okay. <laughs> I'll take it. I, I didn't look at it as a funny thing, but I think, I guess it is sort of humorous in a sense. I feel like I've never seen that, like, anywhere, though. I feel like people just ignore that that happened, because I swear I've never seen that, like, in GIFs or anything. I feel like I didn't even remember that happened, honestly. So I, when I watched it, I was like, John shot at Rodney and Carson, and to be like, don't shoot it, or, you know, opposite. Don't shoot at John, and Rodney's like, oh, yeah. And I was like, <laughs> so... What the hell is wrong with you people? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I guess I guess it is funny. I'm gonna take it as funny. It's I was mad. I wrote down, <laughs> "Oh fuck this." Um, <laughs> no, it's funny now. <laughs> it's very. It's funny because I'm like, 
the opposite of you right now. I thought it was funny, but now thinking about it, I'm like, this is actually really <laughs> fucked up and really morbid humor to like have a guy like, ha ha, funny. He actually, he had shot at him. Ha ha. I was like, what the fuck? This is not normal. This is not funny. I think it would be funnier if <laughs> we're adding layers here. Um, if this episode was in itself more comedic, then maybe it would have worked. But like right now, it's like, oh, this is actually, yeah, this is really bad. And it's actually not funny to have someone shoot at another. Like in general, like generally yeah, shooting people is not that fun. But like accidentally and as a funny haha moment, it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's true. That's true. <laughs> Especially when you gave context, like, you were talking about how, like, John um, gave Rodney his firearm, so it's like, <laughs> that he then shoots him with, so it's like, or tries to shoot him with, so it's like, you know, oh, so, so lovely John is giving Rodney his firearm because he trusts him again after all of this shit that they went through with the Trinity thing, and then, you know, like, he's like, oh, Rodney's not gonna oh. shoot anybody with my firearm because it's Rodney, you know, save Rodney. He's not going to give his gun to Caldwell because Caldwell's just going to turn around and shoot him. Like, it's like not even not even a thought. Like, just give it to Rodney. And then Rodney turns around and shoots him, which is just terribly morbid. But I still find a little bit funny because, of course, John's life, that would happen to him 100%. Also, I forgive Rodney because I feel like if someone is shooting at you, like, your first impulse would be to shoot back if you have a gun in your hand. And I think John would understand you eventually. Maybe not right away, but... <laughs> yeah. Um. Also, you're right, because in context with, like, the episode, because Ro- uh, Ronan gets injured, um, he gets shot, I think, by Elizabeth later on in the episode, and that certainly isn't played for laughs. Um, it's quite sad and scary because he has to go into surgery in the pitch black darkness um so yeah the tonal shift of the episode is uh can be jarring for sure yeah but sorry to go back to the scene where rodney shoots at john <laughs> accidentally that whole scene is so funny and especially after john like john just disappears just runs for it and Elizabeth Elizabeth stays, and that scene, it's so funny. At first, I think she talks to Rodney, and then Carson chimes in, and she's like, doesn't even look at him, just shoots him, and she drops. And then, like, oh, call security, and Rodney trying to, like, stall security. He's like, the, he's the worst liar in the whole world. It's insane. And she's like, oh, forget it. And shoots him as well. It's so funny. Oh my god. I I love evil Elizabeth. Or like, Yeah, it's fun to see this side of her because she's normally like such a fair person, like always advocating for like peace. Usually when the boys are not in her ear whispering about torture and bombs and all this stuff. Um, so it was kind of fun to see her be like a little like, malicious. Because she's so not like that. Um, but also to see her be like an action hero, which we never get to see um, before this or again after this, I feel like. So it's, it's a nice new side to her. That's it's fun. Yeah. It's really nice to see Tori get to actually, like, uh, like, use some of her other skills. You know, I feel like Elizabeth is unfortunately, like, a very, like, um, restrained character, I feel like is the best way kind of to describe her. And I think some of it is a part of the character, and some of it is just the lack of creativity from the writers. Um, but I also just, yes, getting to see her, like, again, like, pick up a gun and, like, get to have, like, comedy and like get to also be badass and get to be threatening in a way that elizabeth can just never be um which is really fun and i feel like i totally get like i feel like if you ask tori she'd probably say like this is one of the most memorable moments for her on the show because yeah she gets to do so much in a way that she never does (laughs) yeah um tori actually said that she's in the audio commentary for this episode which is 
amazing, by the way. And if you have the DVDs, please listen to the audio commentary. It is so cute. They are having just so much fun. Tori is really, really sweet. And she giggles a lot in the beginning, which is like, no. Oh. Anyways, um, and she said in there that this was one of her, like, maybe the most fun episode for her to do. Because she got so much to do. And now, yes, Tori. Okay, first of all, I want to say... Tori's acting in this episode is amazing. It's insane. It's, wow. I'm in awe. I love it especially in the beginning. So after she's been imprinted and she wakes up in the infirmary. Also, it is so cute that everyone is waiting for her to wake up. And then, so it, it's a whole, it's fetus the whole time. We learn later that she never let Elizabeth talk. But, like, the nuances of acting of Phoebus, like, Tori acting as Phoebus, acting as Elizabeth. I love that. I love that kind of meta shit, So, mm. And I think she does it so well. And, like, you, like, when you watch it, you know it's not Elizabeth. That's too much, too much joy too much excitement maybe that she carries to the outside and um yeah i was i was amazed by that and then also later um when i think it's just as when they open the second pot and elizabeth or like phoebus goes to the to the pot and just looks at it and i think she just raises an eyebrow and i'm like this is this is this is not Elizabeth. This is and I think it's just a tiny moment you know, like, oh something like she has I feel like she has a bigger reaction to seeing this face than Elizabeth would have had. And I think the their fetus kinda of slips out and that's hmm. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, absolutely. Like the nuances of her acting even in her physicality. Like even in just the first um uh, clinic scene when she's first imprinted like you can tell even just by body language um and i feel like it's so hard to um act as a different character but she manages to do that by like her speech patterns as well um tone of voice like it's just it's just wow it was really it was fun um she really proved that she should get way more screen time than she does um because her character can be so fun yeah it was great it was yeah and and just like giving him her more to do but you, you just mentioned her physicality like Tori can do a lot and again i am uh reaching forward but this one fight sequence where elizabeth fights like i think three or four guards that was the stunt double that was Tori herself. Oh, she fucking did that. Wow. I I didn't know that. I was I I heard that. I was like, wait, you're joking, right? You're joking. And I went back and listened to it again and tried to find like something. I was like, no, it's actually it's actually her. So she can do that, and that they just wasted not only the potential of the character, but the potential of like what Tori as an actor can do. Made me, made me really sad. But we got this episode, and I'm, I'm really, really thankful for it. And for just like, just seeing, it's weird saying Elizabeth because it's not Elizabeth. But it's like seeing Elizabeth go crazy, just going ham on, like, through the city. It's just, it just means a lot to me, okay? <laughs> and I think it's absolutely one of the reasons why I enjoy this episode so much. Just like, Seeing her doing so much, just like running around the city, uh, yeah, shooting people, stunning people. Not that she shot Ronan, that's not the fun part, but like fighting people and like being angry at John and being so evil. She was so, she was really, really evil. That was a re- evil character. And I really like evil women. <laughs> so <laughs> seeing, seeing an evil woman portrayed by Tori it just did a lot to me for me yeah absolutely and it just makes me more mad because we you can see from this episode that she's so willing to do like the physical stuff like the fighting and, 
and stuff. So it makes me upset when, like, you know, it came out that she was so, she, like, she wanted um, Taylor, like, scenes of Taylor and Elizabeth, like, training. Like, I feel like they missed an opportunity there with her character, especially after seeing her in this episode. Like, they should have been inspired. And they're like, oh my gosh, yeah, like, why don't we, we incorporate some of that physicalness into Elizabeth's character, like, slowly over the seasons, you know, in a way that's that's real, but also, like, interesting and compelling and adds to her character. Because they always complained about, like, not knowing what to do with her, but, like, look right there, like, this is something that you could have taken advantage of in the story. So, yeah, I'm glad at least we got this taste of it. Yeah. Also, you're the writer. You're you're literally in charge of the character. If something's missing, you have the power to add it. I'm getting mad here. <laughs> yeah, and rightfully so. It's true. Yeah, we were robbed. But Sam, tell us what what didn't you like about Elizabeth in this episode? That is a good question. Well, okay, I feel like it just kind of leads into like what we've been talking about the whole season, right? Well, not in the beginning. I think they did a well, just intruder. A good job of sort of having Elizabeth be around and be present and be like engaged in the story, right? I feel like Intruder was like the best, one of the best they've done so far, besides like season one stuff. Definitely the best in season two, I think. And also Critical Mass, which is something that I had completely forgotten. But Elizabeth actually got like some decent time in that. And she got to like, you know, show off why she's like the leader of Atlantis and like all this stuff. Um Oh, what this episode just frustrates me, though, is that, once again, this is not an Elizabeth episode. It's not Elizabeth. Like, it is cool. Like, it, it, it's a Tory episode, which is great. I love seeing Tory actually, like, being used and stuff in a way that, like, you know, Elizabeth isn't. And it's fun that she got to sort of do all these different things. But it does absolutely nothing, once again, for Elizabeth's character. Like I'm trying to tell, like, what does this episode do for do for her? It creates a new awkward tension between her and her military officer. Yeah, she does a cute little like rolls into herself at the end of the episode, and I was like, oh, I crack up every time. It is so cute. Just seeing her like visibly uncomfortable with like being, oh, oh shit, this is this is gonna haunt me. It's that so funny. Was, like, yeah, that. And then obviously, of course, the intro scene with her being really sweet to Kolwa and inviting him down um, are, like, the two only good things about this Elizabeth episode, quote-unquote. I think another thing, too, is um, that's not something I, like, was super upset about. But again, like, when they're about to open the pod, Elizabeth's like, ooh, this is ancient? I'm like, yeah. I want to hear you <laughs> say the word ancient another time. I'm like, I'm sick. And Roddy's like, no, it's like a different design. And I'm like, oh my god. Like, I was like, are you kidding me? And then she gets overtaken by this freaking alien. And then that's it. Then we, then she just come in for the next, you know, 35 minutes of the episode. So for me, it's just really refreshing at this point because I think this is something we've talked about, but it feels like Atlantis thinks they did an amazing job setting up each character in season one. And I, I you know, we talked, we agree that they, I think they did some great, like, foundations for these characters and what these characters can and or should become. But I think in season two, it's just so obvious that they were just like, well, we did all the work we wanted to. Now we can just like, like write episodes and like everyone will like, you know, love it and be like, oh, this is just so Elizabeth or this is so Kayla. And it's like, you didn't do the work. You didn't do the work to make them stand out or make them unique or make them like, make the audience understand like their what they're feeling in this scene, especially with the women, right? Especially with the girls. Um, it just never feels like we understand them completely. It feels like there's something missing. And it is really unfortunate because I think it's just a problem in all of Atlantis. And I mean, not just Atlantis, right? I think SG-1 suffers from it as well, but like less. I think SG-1, surprisingly, SG-1 did better with the women sometimes. And I obviously think Universe did the best out of the three, to be honest. I think Universe really, you know, you feel like each female character in the universe is like her own person as the, her own wants her likes her feelings i could not tell you what elizabeth taylor or keller want or like what's their ambition in life what's their desires what, what are their likes what are their dislikes you know 
know, it just watching this episode, I was just like, you haven't earned this episode. You haven't earned this episode that Elizabeth can go off and like be like another person and like do all these things. I don't know. I also think it's also again questions again. I feel like John got more of the emotional moments of the episode, and again, it's like okay. Maybe if they would have given some of those to Elizabeth, I would have felt like differently. Like, okay, you know, we can see she really cares for her team. But again, Elizabeth is the one that shot Ronan, and yet John and Ronan have like a way more complex scene about that. All Elizabeth gets with that is like John telling her that she shot Ronan, and she's like, oh my god, is he okay? And that's it, then they move past it. And then again, they could have been a really complex thing with her and Taylor um, at the end, but it's given to John and Taylor, which is just a whole other thing. Um, and so, again, I'm just, I don't know. I just, I've left wanting more. And, yeah, it's just, just frustrating, I think. I I totally get the frustration, especially because I feel like they set up stuff or they give us crumbs. And then... There's like little follow through, or there's more focus on the male characters than the female characters. So, um, like you were mentioning, I feel like the episode definitely focused more on the emotional impact of, um, you know, John's actions that were out of his control, um, on John, uh, more than it, it focused on the emotional impact on Elizabeth, which is a shame. Um, considering I feel like because she was the first to be imprinted, um, and the focus was kind of on her in the beginning of the episode, um, it just kind of feels like, why, why didn't we talk about Elizabeth's feelings about these things? So I totally agree on that point, Uh, especially her relationships with Ronan and Taylor in particular. Um, you know, Ronan's reaction to uh we're being compromised was really interesting to me like he was like really shocked and concerned when Codwell mentioned that we're was not really we're and it was Phoebus the whole time he was like we're like what um and I think they have a really interesting dynamic that hasn't been explored enough in the show up to this point and like we've been getting little hints of it but not a lot like um you know, earlier on in the season, Elizabeth really wanting Ronan to stay, and that sort of, like, awkwardness between them was really cute and endearing and interesting, and I feel like the, her shooting him in this episode, like, they could have done something there um, in terms of their relationship that was kind of a missed opportunity. Similarly, I feel like with Taylor and Elizabeth, there's a really interesting conversation that Ronan and Tayla have when they're tracking um, John and Elizabeth through the city and Ronan is like you handle Elizabeth and Taylor's like why are you taking John and then he's like because you understand how she thinks like I don't I don't understand how she thinks and like you can interpret that as a really misogynistic line or you can interpret it as something more compelling and interesting in that Taylor and Elizabeth have things in common they think similarly, um, and that's why Ronan suggests that she tracks her instead. And that could have been explored. Like you were saying, Sam, that final confrontation that occurred between John and Taylor, I think really belonged to Taylor and Elizabeth. And it would have made more sense to me in terms of the setup. Because you had the John versus Ronan, and then you could have had the, the Taylor versus Elizabeth um, situation. So then each character kind of gets their own confrontation with a member of the team. But except it was just all given to John <laughs> for some reason, um, unfortunately. And I get it, like, Surprise. he's the main character in quotations, but, like, there's a whole cast of people on the show that are really interesting characters. And, like, yeah, John is cool and interesting, too, but, like, all of the episodes about him and his relationship with other people, like, let other people have a turn. That's why two cents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think you both make really, really good points. And especially what Sam said earlier about this is not an Elizabeth episode, it's a Tori episode. And that's definitely true. And 
I think it's also a reason why I love this episode, because it's a Tori episode and I love her. Um, so I think in that sense, it's good enough for me uh, to, to make it enjoyable. I'm still going to stick with that. I think if you look at this on this episode on the surface, it's very fun. If you don't look that deep, it's not that deep, this episode. But yeah, when you kind of dissect it like we're doing, then yeah, a lot of issues arise. A whole John, in quotation marks, appealing to Taylor like an emotional, like on an emotional level is like, no, it doesn't make any sense. And oh no. Now, that also brings up like, they try to apply to that, oh, John and Taylor were meant from the beginning. Um, but then they also had like this John and Elizabeth set up at the beginning of the episode. So now it's like a love triangle. What the fuck? That's not really necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Love. I'll say it was confusing. Like, yeah. For me, it totally makes sense that you want to have episodes where you're exploring these relationships and you're seeing, is there chemistry here? So, like, this episode should have been John and Elizabeth focused in the sense that they should, I feel like the Taylor and John moment was out of place in this episode. Like, if you wanted yeah. to explore their relationship in a different episode, sure. But in this episode, you're clearly playing on the tension between John and Elizabeth. You're trying to see what's happening there in terms of, like, audience reaction and, like, actor chemistry. So, like, why are you confusing and muddling the pot with, like, Taylor and John? Like, just keep it with, like, the the cute, awkward, like, John and Elizabeth banter and, like, don't confuse it with this whole weird Taylor and John thing. For what reason? I don't get it. Do it in another episode, not this one. Yeah. Oh my god, I hate so much what you said. Um, okay. <laughs> First of all, I want to jump back a little bit and I want to go back to the Taylor Beth aspect of it. And I wanted to ask a genuine question, actually. When was the last time Taylor and Elizabeth interacted? That's a good question. Um, I could try to find something. <laughs> My rectal test thingy. So take a moment. I feel like that's an answer in itself. Like that we we had to think about yeah. it so long to like. Yeah. When the last interview. So yeah. So it failed about a little bunch of times. Uh, they could have been in the same scene together in some of them. I'm at the hive right now and still nothing. Uh, no, not looking good. Oh, dear. I love Sam's face right now. It's just like so <laughs> disappointed. The disappointment is real. Yeah, I really had no... I just needed to bring that up. <laughs> I had no follow-ups to that. I just needed to make that known. Because I was thinking, I was like, okay, the last time I remember... And it's something that we fabricated from what I last remember. <laughs> is there's a tiny, a tiny little fucking nod between Elizabeth and Taylor in conversion. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Nope. Yeah. No word. A nod. Yeah. Yeah. That was eight episodes ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My heart. <laughs> Uh, second of all, I did want to mention this as well, because I know I kind of gave, um, sort of a more comedic version of what this episode could have been. However, when I was watching it as well, since I was, I really was not even thinking about, like, the comedy aspect, I was taking it so seriously, because I, I really didn't find it very funny, except for, like, the beginning part. After a while, I was like, okay, no, this is just, like, full action. Um, but my original idea was for more, to take it even in a more serious direction, I was thinking, I was like, okay, I was like, how do we incorporate John and Elizabeth in this episode, though? And there's that one scene where John is telling Ronan, like, oh, or Thalen is telling Ronan, like, oh, yeah, John's screaming, like, he's so upset right now that, like, you're hurt. And I was like, oh, I wrote down, I was like, what I would give to get that scene, right, of John screaming for Ronan and trying to, like, get Thalen to listen to him and to like break out of his own head. And so my initial idea for this episode was, what if everything can stay the same, fine. But to add that extra layer of character and what, what I'm missing from this episode is seeing John and Elizabeth trapped 
inside their heads and seeing the reactions to things that are happening. And I know it might be kind of funny or like kind of difficult to film. You probably have to get them like in a black room with maybe just like a, you can maybe see like, um, sort of like a first person point of view, maybe for some of these, maybe it would have been kind of weird. So maybe they could have figured out another way, but I think that could have been so interesting to add to this episode and to really make it more than just these two alien people are like taking over these characters that we love and we don't see them for the whole episode. I think it would have been so cool to see Elizabeth's reaction to accidentally shooting Ronan or Elizabeth's reaction to threatening to kill the whole city. And that would like just destroy her emotionally. And again, seeing John, you know, he didn't even want to do this and then having to like immediately be like, oh, I'm fucked. It was like the initial reaction to being stuck inside this body. And then again, as he goes, you know, as Thalen snowballs further and further, um, seeing John's reaction to all of that. And then again, at the end, waking up and having that moment where they look at each other. And maybe they're sort of set, like kind of looking at each other like, like, did you experience what I experienced? As in, we were both like, you know, watching helplessly. Um, and again, this is more of a serious take, but I think that would have been another way they could have gone about this episode. Oh, shit. Or they could have done it just like they did with uh, in Duet, but maybe they didn't want it to copy it, that they just have, like, the voices. Oh, uh, like, yeah. you know, we had, like, Cadman talking with um, Rodney and just, like, well, just her voice. So they could have done that. And, oh, wow. They would have been, I'm not sure I could have handled that emotionally. But it would have been so interesting because, yes, having them trapped in their own body, but with no way to control it, like in no way, you see, they really, they were completely suppressed, but they were still aware of what was happening, is terrible. And then seeing them hurt people, people they love and that they care about, and threatening to destroy basically everything that Elizabeth cares for. Um, terrible. Oh, I would have. Mm, I don't know if that would have been out of character, but if we got to hear like their what they had to say about what they were screaming inside there, because Elizabeth said that she was screaming inside there to have actually have that to have like Elizabeth really emotional, like slowly noticing like oh this is terrible like in the beginning maybe she was confused and then slowly she realized what was happening maybe she even was talking to phoebus in her mind i don't know if that happened if that could have happened or if phoebus would have allowed that but like trying to talk to her trying to talk to everyone else um and then just like losing it more and more in her mind like literally trapped in her mind Ooh. I'm I'm only thinking of Elizabeth because I'm very focused on her. Sorry. I I'm sure it would have been equally terrible for John. <laughs> but yeah, I wow. Wow. Was cool. Would have been cool if there's I don't know if it if it exists or like a, a fanfic about like this episode but from Elizabeth's perspective. Or John's. <laughs> it's okay. He got enough attention. I'm biased. Episode. I'm so fucking biased. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Totally understandable. He got enough attention this episode. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we gotta we gotta go on the hunt and see if there's anything in our, our beloved AO3 tag <laughs> like that. Um, but yeah, I think it's really cool. Another way I could have done it is like have film the scene twice and have like the scene them acting as like the alien first and then them playing their character like John or Elizabeth the second time and then like so like everyone around them is acting like they're they're saying like Phoebus and Thalen's lines but they're like yeah it's them still oh. standing in the scene oh. but like they can't move their body the way they want and like they're basically nobody can hear them I mean interesting interesting way to portray that trapped feeling I think it's cool it's a really cool idea it's such a mind fuck. I love it. Yeah. Like, it's just so Atlantis, I feel like, to do that kind of, right? I think it could have been sort of like a hint of what the show will become in later seasons. And I was just thinking mm. about it, too. I was like, they kind of did not 
that they did it. But an interesting way they could have filmed that as well would have been um, kind of copying maybe what they did in... Is it Nightmares? I don't remember the title of these episodes. Oh, yeah. No, um, like Doppelganger is one? Nightmare? Yeah, Doppelganger. There you go, Doppelganger. Uh, Doppelganger, yeah. We're so like John and like his fake John are basically like duking it out in sort of like a fake Atlantis. <laughs> that would have been kind of interesting to see like you know, Phoebus versus Elizabeth, and but they're like, you know, in her office or like they're in different parts of the city and she's like, stop this. And sort of like a mental thing where it's like, let me get control. And then maybe it shows like Elizabeth's trying to come out or like maybe she gets like a word out or something. But then Phoebus overtakes her again and she's thrown back into this like fake mind Atlantis thing. That'd be cool. That'd have been so cool. Yeah. I wonder if anything like that was, was planned. To like have, um, mm. yeah, have Elizabeth and John, like actually El- Elizabeth and John a bit more present, or if it was um, like dropped for some reason. Yeah, I do wonder. I do wonder. Yeah. Okay. Let's actually <laughs> for all the we haven't been talking a lot about the what ifs. Um, we're gonna come back to John and Taylor though because I have another mm. rant, but I feel like we need to break it up really quick. So I was gonna say, let's talk about. Rodney and Caldwell and Carson because there's kind of a lot there. Yeah. Of course I'm going to defend my boy and I was very... I was so mad. I was just mad at Caldwell a little bit. I won't lie. I was like Rodney's right in that he is like the senior most senior person on Atlantis when both John and Elizabeth are out of commission. Um, so it's really him in charge. And he came up with a plan to track them with the life science detector. Like, he knew what he was doing. Um, but of course, Caldwell railroads him completely um, with the, in my opinion, excuse that it's a military operation. And so um, he should be in charge. Because he's military. And I'm like, you're totally undermining the fact that Atlantis is supposed to be a civilian expedition and civilian run. And like, of course, Rodney should be in charge if Elizabeth is out of commission because they're both civilians. Hello? Huh? (laughs) Like, what? I like, why? You don't even belong here. Like, it's not even like it's Lorne. Or somebody who is military, like, 2IC on Atlantis. It's some, yeah, well, he's not random, but he is kind of a random guy coming in from another military ship being like, oh, yeah, now I'm in charge. Like, who, who said, who said you're in charge? I don't, I don't, I don't get it. I just don't. And then just treating them so poorly, like, almost condescending in a sense, like, oh, oh, you know, you silly civilians don't know what you're talking about. When Carson was like, why don't we just talk to them instead of, like, shooting at them as the first resort? This is Carson talking. Come on. (laughs) You know, telling them to, like, talk it out first instead of being messy like this. Um, But, of course, again, railroaded by Caldwell. So, like, I'm kind of understanding why... Atlantis peeps, like, and, like, Rodney in particular, is a little bit antagonistic towards Caldwell because of the way this went down. And, like, I kind of get it because, of course, Rodney and Carson are more emotionally compromised in this position because they're, Elizabeth and John are their friends and, like, they don't want them to die or get hurt in a skirmish, even though they are, like, gonna kill the city. Um, but, like, I don't know, I just think he went about it in an asshole way. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, um, so sorry. I'm not the only one who thought that. <laughs> no, no. Everything you just said with the... Uh, and he, John, uh, John, Rodney even brings it up that he says like, oh, you're here one week out of six. Why Why you, should you take command? So yes, he is just some random guy. Maybe he, like half random. Like he's there, but... Also, a lot of times, he's not. So, it 
no, it doesn't make sense that you take command. You don't know the city that well. You don't know the people that well. Also, why is it his um, security teams? I don't get it. He's not in charge of security. That's Lorne, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um. Yes, this is a fucking civilian operation still. But yeah. Mm. <laughs> No, just no, it just like, he just he shuts Rodney down so much, and I was so I was so proud of uh, Rodney for saying so. Hey, no, I'm like I actually I'm like in command right now, or I should be because like John and Elizabeth are right here, so actually command would fall to me. I like to acknowledge that. I was like, yeah, yeah, give command to me, and I was like, actually, I'm not sure if he, I don't know if he would manage. If he could manage that, that was my second thought. But that's a different, that's a whole different issue. Like, it's just the way that Culver waltzes in there and pretends that he he's the king of the castle, basically. Especially with what happened, like, two episodes ago. It's, it's actually, it's a bit fishy. Like, you're just like, oh, I'm in control, come on now. Even though. Yeah. A hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, no, of course I'm Team Rodney on this. But <laughs> I'm also just like, I would be salty as hell too if this guy just came in and started bossing me around as if he wasn't possessed. Again, like Ash said, um, two ups to go. But like a gold, like, are you kidding me? Like, I don't trust you yet. And Rodney was doing all the work. Rodney was doing everything, basically. And so all Caldwell did, really, is just like give out the commands. And, like, he added, like, nothing really to his command. I think, to be honest, too, I was trying to think. I was like, does Rodney ever get left in charge? Oh, him and... Oh, this is depressing. Him and John are, like, joint in charge when Elizabeth has that accident with the star drive. Right. That one time. Right. Which doesn't go particularly well for either of them, but... (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Depressing thought. Say, I was like, I feel like they don't. Yeah, I feel like they don't trust Rodney to be in charge. But I'm kind of like Rodney to be in charge. I mean, it's not like the Wraith are like invading or anything. Like, I'm not saying this isn't a dangerous situation, but I feel like you know he was basically doing all the work. I feel like uh, I wish he would have been in charge at least for like an episode. Like, you know, like I feel like everyone, everyone should have got the chance to be in charge. You know, like even Taylor Gaunt, which is great. I love it. Not complaining about that. But I think Ronan deserved it, and I think Rodney deserved it. <laughs> but serious question, do you think he would make a good leader of, like, or, like, a good job, like, being in charge of the whole of Atlantis? Like, the science seems yes, absolutely. But everyone? Personally, I feel like short-term, sure. He could do it for a day. He could do it in an emergency situation. Uh, Long-term? Absolutely not. It's not his area. Um, definitely not a person who works well with other people. Um, and so I feel like, although he certainly commands respect by like the stuff that he does and his intelligence and blah blah blah, I don't think that he could be like Elizabeth, someone who is, you know, can do that position long term, deal with personnel problems, deal with. Uh, relations on other planets like definitely that's not his area you know <laughs> yeah yeah no i agree i think like especially for this mission i think it would have been perfect if he was in charge like i feel like this is just like kind of what he excels at like he was basically the one doing everything so i feel like he would have just i i don't see him making the situation any worse to be honest um, and I think again, if it's something like within the base, I think yeah, I trust him with that. Obviously, I don't, I wouldn't, I don't know if I trust him with like the wraith stuff. I feel like that's not really where his expertise would shine, and he he's usually the one to like suggest like threat, like running or like you know going somewhere else. So yeah, I don't trust him with that. But I think I yeah, I trust him for a day. You know, anything like just overseeing like the normal day to day Atlantis, I'm like okay, he do it for like a week. Before he tries to change something, and then Elizabeth would kick him out. Um, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, same. I I was asking because I was actually thinking about what it meant for Caldwell to take control um, 
command in this sense. And I think, I think I'm not mad that he did it because I'm not sure Rodney could have handled that situation with two people because it's exactly the opposite of what you just said, Sam. It's not the day to day Atlantis. What's happening? But it's like it's a very extreme situation with two people, two of their own people, basically trying to kill each other um, and possibly destroying the um, the base. So I'm not sure if he could have handled that, to be honest. But I'm not saying that. He, like he, yes, he still did all the work and he came up with the ideas. And but I think what. Caldwell was doing is just like delegating and like um sorry like getting the teams moving and everything and I think that was important but I hate that he didn't even acknowledge that um Rodney technically would be in charge or like even putting him in charge and saying okay but we have to do this and this and this not telling him what to do but like um giving his perspective on it with which would be important for like a team to work together. But it was like he was so dismissive of him right from the start. And I think that's what bothers me. Um but not the him eventually like being in command. And he was a bitch throughout the episode, like towards Rodney, so it was kinda unnecessary. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's interesting to look at John and Elizabeth's relationship, and even John and Rodney's relationship in terms of command, um, in comparison to um, Caldwell and Rodney, as like a contrast, and seeing how you know, like, thank, like Sam always says, thank God that John is our military leader, um, on Atlantis because otherwise we'd have a very terrible working dynamic <laughs> on the expedition. I just feel like um, it's so much more collaborative between um, Elizabeth and John and uh, Rodney and John um, where, you know, he he actually treats them like equals even when it's a military situation, quote unquote, and like will take their input into account. Um, versus Caldwell, who is like a bully, where I feel like John is never a bully in that sense. Uh, <laughs> with, with Elizabeth and Rodney. Uh, he's, he's a little bit of a bully in other ways, but not, not like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I also think I, I just wanted to say, I also feel like I wouldn't have like really cared as much if uh, Rodney like wasn't in charge. I also would have cared about it, and, like, I would have been like, okay, whatever, like, maybe it's just he's not ready yet. But I think it would have been really nice to see him take charge eventually, maybe, like, season five or something, to show that, like, I'll trust him, and he's really grown, in his, grown as a leader, not just for the science department, but just for, like, the whole of the Atlantis. And I think that would have been a really nice sort of full circle kind of-ish moment from, like, his first appearance in SG-1, where, like, literally no one takes him seriously at all um because like he's a fucking asshole um <laughs> i think it would be a really important i think i'm kind of just in shock that they never gave that character moment to rodney now like i honestly just didn't realize that was just like non-existent but now i'm like really upset that he never got the chance to just be a leader and have people like take him seriously and like respect his work you know and for him not to sort of feel like he has to sort of put on this sort of like scary mean persona to get people to listen to him and to like take him seriously people just like look at him and they're like no i you know i trust you like i'll tell you what you know i'll do what you want me to do without you having to be this person like he could just be a little this little soft gooey ish person inside obviously not too gooey because it's so rodney but um, it's so I think I'm just gonna cry about that forever. <laughs> Honestly, if Elizabeth had to go the way she did, I would, I would have liked Rodney eventually succeeding her in a way that like respected their relationship and like kind of honored that and like how much he respected her and looked up to her and like 
You know what I mean? Like he, she taught him how to to be better as a person, but also as a leader. And I think that would have been so emotional instead of having goddamn Woolsey randomly in there. Like why? For like. Especially because it was the last season of the show. Like, I just feel like it would have been so much more emotional. Um, and like, like you said, Sam, full circle, um, for him to have that moment. Oh my God. And acknowledge yeah. Elizabeth as a key, important player, even when she was, wasn't there. Do you know, he would have, if Rodney eventually t- took on command of Atlantis, he would, there would be scenes of him like, either talking to other people or, like, doing his report or whatever and being like, oh, I wonder what Elizabeth would have done in this episode, in this uh, situation. I wonder, like, he would he would recall her and would try to, like, he would try, maybe try to channel her a little bit and, like, in that way, let her help him in this position and, like, are you still like a little bit guiding him, like mentally? And of course, not really because he wouldn't be there, but I think he would do that. Absolutely. Oh. Wow, I'm like mourning this like fake plot we just dreamed up of. It's <laughs> so good. And I think it would, would make really perfect sense if Wolsey was a leader in season four, because like obviously like, they're rushing to replace Elizabeth really quick. So I think it would have made sense if they would have gone for like in. IOA ish type of person mm. or like someone like again like that and then I think it would have been so nice to like have him at the end be like no like I'm stepping down or like something where he's just like it's not working out but like I know who to recommend or like I know who'd make a better or you know who do better than me because he could be like I don't get it I don't get Atlantis in the way that like you guys do you know kind of again like just solidifying that um some people like feel differently about the city like once you've lived there once you like experience things and once you've grown together with the people and again sort of adding that sort of like what elizabeth left behind and like her legacy i think that's been really cool for for woolsey or like whatever kind of ioa character to be like i get it <laughs> i'm not what the city needs and like you know and i don't get this place but but you know rodney does like it's yours now like you take over i think that would have been so great but i also i was thinking though too and i i would want like taylor and ronan to also get mm-hmm, like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um promoted in some way i was trying to think though like i don't want to take lauren's job away <laughs> i was like it would be nice for ronan to be like maybe like the head of security or something i don't fucking know or something like that or maybe he just gets like um promoted into like the u.s military navy or i don't fucking know he just gets like a little like military he, he wears a military jacket or something like an honorary member or yeah. whatever um and then Taylor, maybe she can get the title of ambassador she already has that yeah yeah but they can make like a bigger deal out of it and be like okay yeah. like you're the one we sent forward like she takes more, oh she could take more of like the negotiation side of elizabeth's mm-hmm. job over yeah. And she could be, like, the official ambassador of Atlantis. And they send her with Rodney and John, of course, and Ronan and everyone when they're going to, like, actually give her, like, something to do. Like, the role she's supposed to have, like, make her the number one. Because Rodney, I think no matter how much time passes, negotiation... No. I'm definitely not. No. No. Not happening. No. But similarly, I feel like if it would be emotional in the sense that that Rodney's success as Elizabeth, I think it would be equally, if not more so, emotional if Taylor were to succeed Elizabeth yeah, in that yeah. way as well. Just because, again, like this episode was iterating, I wish it emphasized more, but, you know, they have a connection. They they understand each other. So I feel like it's just another one of those, like, it just made sense to me. Yeah. As yeah. like a, yeah. For sure. I was thinking that. I was like, but, uh, I was like, you know, uh, I mean, so cool. But this is how, you know, we're really writing our own fact- fan fiction. <laughs> these pictures would never. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. No. It should have been. Yeah. Yeah. There's, wow. I just want to say, though, I feel like it's pretty telling that we've talked more about what this episode could have been than this <laughs> actual episode. Yeah. Uh, True, yeah. fair. I want to go back to the like 
they're like two Taylor Beth crumbs yeah. here. Like the one, like, oh, you, like, you know how how she thinks. I have no idea what she's thinking, how she's thinking. I was like, that's kind of funny. And I, I did read it, like, Ronan says that, and I didn't read it as uh, misogynistic, but more like, yeah, this woman is just a mystery to me. <laughs> and John, like, he's military. I get what he, like, how he thinks. Um, but yeah, also, like, this Hayla and Elizabeth, they they know each other, and they they have a connection. And then also, a scene that always makes me scream, it's nothing, it could be read as nothing, but I choose to read a lot into it, is when Taylor is, like, going after Elizabeth on her own, and... Like, I think she's like, oh, I'm close to her, and John is also in the area. And then she says, like, yeah, I can handle Elizabeth. And I'm like, girl, girl. In you end, Joe. <laughs> yeah. I'll take it. The thing is, I read into these, like, five words. Is, um, <laughs> okay, we're all guilty. Yes, I, be- I, yeah, I believe her when she says that. But also, sorry, I'm going onto the what if road again, but it would have been fun to see. Taylor and Elizabeth, or like Taylor and Phoebus fight. Yes! Um, yes. Like, we see what um, Phoebus can do, like, physically, how she can overpower three Marines, basically. Like, it's nothing. And it was so fucking smooth. I was like, damn. So, there, there has to be, like, some. Elizabeth has to have some training to. Because, like, you have to know how to use your body somehow. Like, there's muscle memory and all that. So, this is the, I don't think it came out of nowhere that she was able to do that. And not just Phoebus, but also, like, yeah, Elizabeth's um, training that she definitely had and that we didn't make up ourselves. Um, so, I think it would have been fun to see her and Taylor go in a fight. Maybe not, a, like, a shootout, but, like, an actually actual fight, there probably wouldn't be any sticks but like, if they lost their weapons or they were like, out of ammunition or whatever um, it would have been fun to see there and see if they were a match or if Taylor would win still because she's such a skilled fighter or if Elizabeth slash Phoebus were able to defeat her. Damn! Yeah, no, that would have been really cool, actually. And again, we just haven't had enough of Taylor, like, using her fighting skills, to be honest. Like, mm-hmm. I haven't seen that woman fight, and I'm just like, get rid of the gun, bitch. I'm like, I don't care about the gun. I want to see you use your fists. I want yes. to see you bitch slap someone, because you're so cool when you do it. And she's yes. so tiny. It's just so fun to watch her. And I feel like she has such, like, a... Um... Actually, I wonder if Rachel has, like, a dancing background or something, because I just feel like her, her steps can be so fluid. And I feel like that's definitely something that a dancing background would influence. I think she does. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I know that she's definitely a singer. Um, but I think also dancing and acting. Yeah, obviously. I mean, you can tell I think in her yeah. performance it definitely impacts like the way she fights and the way she can kind of I don't really memorize her moves, but it just feels like fluid. It feels like a dance almost sometimes. And yeah. not in like a bad way, like, oh it's rehearsed. Like no, I just feel like it just feels so natural no. to her. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I agree. It's very, yeah. Like, there's a kind of control that she has over her body that I think comes a lot from dancing. And can come from dancing. Definitely. Yeah. While we're on the subject, I think it's time we talk about Taylor, though. (laughs) Okay. Um... I don't remember, I should have written down the timestamp, but there's a moment towards, you know, the ending-ish, where, you know, Taylor was, like, sh- stunned by Thalen, so she's, like, laying on the floor, and then, like, you know, the door's about to close on her, and she, like, wakes up suddenly, and then she's saved, you know, right? Okay, I, it was at that moment, where I was like, oh my god, I'm so glad you're okay, you almost died, bitch. And then I was <laughs> like, thinking about it, I was like, she has said... <laughs> like five words this entire episode i felt like she was so not present here and then all of a sudden in the last like 10 minutes she becomes like the focal point and her relationship with john is suddenly like the key in this episode and we kind of touched on it previously and how it just feels so weird that they're trying to shove in so many relationships 
and being like, this is the focus of the episode. No, this is the focus of the episode. Um, and it definitely just comes across as like very jumbled and stuff. But I also just kind of want to bring up, um, I feel like I'm being gaslit. <laughs> I just know. That's how I feel at this point. Not only with the Taylor and John stuff, where I feel like I'm being told that they're destined for each other, and being told that they're like this emotional crux of a show, and you know, and I'm not even trying to be mean. Like, if you ship Taylor and John and you see it, like, good. I'm happy for you. I'm happy that it works for you. But for me, it just doesn't. It doesn't click. And I, that's why I say I feel like I'm being gassed by the show. Not only just about the Taylor and John stuff, but as Taylor's a character. Because I'm tired of them doing this. I'm tired of them being like, she's so important to the show. Or like, she's so, like, cr- like um, yeah, again, like, important to John as, a, like, a person and all this stuff. And they don't show it, but they'll bring it out for these crucial moments, right? Taylor did nothing this episode. Um, she, again, she said, like, five... She said a few lines, but again, it was mostly just her, like, walking around in the dark, being like, with a fake gun, okay? Um, and then all of a sudden, in the last ten minutes, uh, ten minutes, it becomes, wow, her relationship with John is, like, so important. And, like, wow, she's the emotional center of this episode. And it doesn't work. And I'm, again, I'm just so, I'm tired. We're only in season two, and I'm exhausted by it. And I'm... That's why I say I feel like I'm being gaslit. And I wanted to bring up something that I told Tor and Ash off camera. Um, but I was looking up some Straight Universe uh, interviews a while ago, and I was just trying to find some things. And I stumbled across this interview with the full cast, and a bunch of reporters were asking the Straight Universe um, writers, obviously like Brad Wright and stuff, about a, bu- a bunch of different topics. And one reporter stood up and asked, a question towards Sukuman and the writers and said, so I'm going to paraphrase this because I don't remember really, but she basically said something about, um, so how are like the women like as characters in this show? Are they like, you know, strong women or whatever? And then she said, and how are they different from like the way Kayla was handled or something, something along those lines. Okay. And the entire cast got so awkward, and I was so... Okay, to be fair, it's not a question that I feel like maybe should have been asked towards the new actresses in-universe, but I do think it was a question that was, like, needed to be brought up to the writers. And what everyone said kind of pissed me off, mainly Brad Wright. Brad Wright answers the question first, I believe, and he gets very sort of, like defensive about it and he's like well i don't know what the person i don't know what you mean by like taylor um because taylor had a lot of storylines and like taylor was a really important character in Atlantis. and he says well but we don't want to that's in the past and then ming now wen starts talking and she starts saying well you know like all of our characters are very different and unique which is something i appreciate and she says you know stargate has always i think she says something that like stargate has always um had strong women in the forefront which um okay she brings up sam carter and I'm like, i see where you're going with it mm-hmm. so i think that's what like just hearing that interview which you can find on youtube by the way just search up like stargate universe interviews and it's like a six-part thing um they asked a bunch of reporters were there and in one of the parts they brought up this question um but especially after hearing that and again that was so long ago but to hear that, like, Taylor's, like, constantly, like, you know, brought up and, like, recognized among fans, like, they did her so dirty. And for the writers to just not acknowledge it and to try to brush it under and be like, no, 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 we did her justice. Or, like, she did, you know, she's a great character. Like, you know, she's well-rounded. Like, it makes me so mad. So having that, like, this is what I said about the episode where it's like, I can't ignore what we've been feeling frustrated about this whole season. I think that plays into this episode heavily because I, I'm i just angry. I'm just so angry about what's happening to Taylor. And, like, she's not in the show. <laughs> she's not in the show. And it feels like a slap in the face to call her, like, the female lead. And, you know, to have her, you know, or to just tell everyone no we did a good job with her like she's a great character not only because the fact because one she's a woman but two again this is the first 
POC woman basically on Stargate for longer than like two episodes. Okay. Four episodes. Okay. That wasn't immediately killed off for man pain. Look at Daniel's wife. Look at Teal'c's wife. Okay. They were all white women were in SG-1. Ten seasons. The women that lasted were white. Period. Okay. There's not another POC woman until, I mean, after Taylor, until Universe. And yes, I think Universe did a much better job with its female characters. And yes, there's only two out of five POC women, but we're going to take that. But it just frustrates me. Sorry, this is such a long run. But I'm just so angry and I'm tired of being told that they're doing a good job with her. And I'm tired of her, of them just bringing her out like a prop and showing the audience like, oh, here, look, this is important. She's important right now. And then throwing her back in, like, some storage closet. Like, that's what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I totally get the frustration in terms of the telling and not the showing. Because as an audience, you want to feel like it's a natural thing. Um, and not so much, like, written to be a thing from the start, like before we even began the show, we knew this was going to happen sort of thing. You kind of want it to be organic. This this combination of writing, actor chemistry, um, the way the story develops, um, that sort of thing. And I find that they do a good job of it with Elizabeth and John, where it's a very natural thing. Like there's this, a natural chemistry between the two actors and um you know the writing is there also versus uh Taylor and John where it feels a little bit like you mentioned um just like telling like he has feelings for you but we never really see that um or feel that in their interactions with each other. Um, so it's kind of hard for the audience to swallow. And it also is irritating in the sense that I don't appreciate her character um, being said that she's important because she's the romantic interest. That should not be the reason she's important to the show. Or she should be important to the audience. She should have her own character arc. She should have her own things going on. And not her relationship with John that makes her pivotal or the heart of the show. That I really don't like. And don't understand. Yeah, it's that. In the first two seasons, I think. Or three. And then later. I don't know, maybe the... Uh, producers, directors, writers forgot about the first three seasons. <laughs> um, because yes, she gets a story on later. She gets a story later on mm. with her pregnancy and her baby, <laughs> <laughs> which again can she be her own character? Oh my God! Oh my God! I think. We might all like we were some blood vessel when we get to season four, five, Kayla. I think that if we're already feeling like this strongly, like it's gonna be hell. And to be honest, I feel like I did not remember how bad it was. I remember saying like, "Oh, maybe this is the season Taylor will get more to do." Like every season, but I think I just like wasn't obviously as in depth. And the more you sort of like sit down as we do and we write down, take notes on everything, and we're rewatching it like full focus, the more it just gets hard to swallow and hard to just not feel like complete rage take over. Like I. <laughs> This has got like genuinely got to be like one of like my least favorite like not least favorite. <laughs> like I have like a ranking of all like my least favorite like you know based to true the female character mm. um no but it's just like one of the worst I think in my opinion and I I just feel like I can't stress it yeah it's just bad it's just really bad and again the fact that they don't take accountability I think from the writers it just makes it more frustrating if they were like hey you're right. We didn't do enough with Taylor, or we didn't know how to make her and John happen organically. 
all of these things, I would have been like, okay, I appreciate that. Listen, I get it. Early 2000s. I'm not saying that, like, you know, obviously white writers, I'm not saying, you know, like, shame on them forever. Like, if they were just genuinely, like, honest, would I, again, I feel like this is a problem with all of Sorry, Like, I feel like the writers in general just aren't honest about, like, the flaws of the franchise. And I feel like that really sort of grinds your gears after a while. And I think just doing it with Taylor is just, it's evil. It's evil. Yeah. I feel like it's this idea where I read this post on Tumblr about Alien and how it's it's such a good film and everyone loves that movie because originally um, the lead role was supposed to be a man and they changed it to a woman, but they didn't change anything about the character. It was the same character. They just cast a woman. And, and it was like revolutionary. It's like, oh, this is how we write women as a person. And not as, like, this strange, different being. Like, no, it's just the same way you would write a man, you would write a woman. And they're just both people. Yeah, but then, yeah I was just gonna say, it, it's just, it's almost as if women are people. Yeah. Crazy, right? And then, for some reason, we, we forgot that that happened in the 80s or 70s, and then we just continued to do this, whatever this is. And I feel like it's an, it's a trope where, like, Again, we have the, oh, we didn't know what to do with her character, so we just killed her off. Or, like, didn't even kill her off, we just kind of, like, shuffled her off screen and didn't give her closure. Because we didn't know how to grow her character. You grow her character like you would any character. I don't know why it was so difficult. Or, you don't know what to do to a character to give them development, so it's the mothering. We mother. We make her mother. And that is a, a way to give her growth and development. We mother her. We make her into a mother. Or, like they did with the Avengers stupidness, and made it like the opposite of mothering, where, oh, she has problems with herself and complications with herself because she can't be a mother. So it's always about reproducing. Because that's what women can do. And nothing else. That's all they're good for. I just... It, it's incredible. I just don't understand <laughs> why this is always happening. And it hasn't changed. No! It hasn't changed since the early 2000s. It's still the same shit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Looking at you, Star Trek Picard. <laughs> um. <laughs> why can't we just let female rage overtake us at this point? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Actually, yeah. See, maybe that's why I like Phoebus in this episode, because it's just like... Heck yeah. Just, just plain evil, just like, letting that rage out. Um, get, maybe, I don't know, I probably, I can't turn this around into something positive, but there <laughs> were two things about Taylor that I liked in this episode, and... It's, of course, in the last ten episode, uh, ten minutes where she got something to do. Um, but, so first of all, Elizabeth says that, oh, I knew someone could get John, it would be you. And I didn't read this as like, oh, she was like, I don't know, seducing him, or like, she's the only one who can get to him emotionally. No, I read that as, I know you can cook, uh, you can kick ass, and that's how you got, like, that to him. Hell yeah. And then, so that's the first thing. Like, she knows Taylor, and, um, that's what she's capable of. And then I love that Taylor was doing what Caldwell refused to do this whole time, trying diplomacy. It was just like one sentence, but she tried to talk to Phoebus to like, um, get her to, I don't remember exactly what she said, but like to try to tell that this is a useless fight and like there's nothing in it for her. And Phoebus disagrees, but that's not a point. I, I like that. Taylor, like, after everything, after, um, like, getting shot and, um, after Rowan getting shot, uh, with all the, with the things that are at stake here, with, like, all the living quarters being almost flooded with, like, gas or whatever, um, and she still tries to, like, use <laughs> words as her weapon. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that and I like that. 
And I think it's just another way in which her and Elizabeth are connected as well. Because I feel like that would be Elizabeth's first thought as well. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Um, yeah. She kept a level head, too, through the whole thing, where all the guys are, like, screaming, yelling. And she was just mm-hmm. calm, cool, and collected. Cucumber Taylor. Uh, so that was also pretty cool. She's always badass, though, so um, yeah. there's that. But I think it was getting to her. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Like, the whole situation. She was like, sweating at the end. I, yeah, she's she so was. And, like, I don't care. It wasn't because she's, like, she has feelings for John. In my opinion, <laughs> it was because, like, she, yeah, she has feelings for John, but, like, she cares for him deeply. In whatever way you want. And that's why, like, she doesn't want to kill him, of course. Of course not. Um, and having, yeah, and like having, hearing with Elizabeth's, Elizabeth's voice to like, oh yeah, kill him. And I think it's, it, it's, yeah, terrible for her. And like, hmm. Ah, this episode is so, hmm, so juicy. It gives so much potential for like, um. Spice. Spice. And also for like a lot of hurt comfort afterwards. Like, there's so much with, like, the, the things that they have to mend with, like, of course, there's, like, John and Elizabeth, they have to kind of find together again, like, they have to cope with this episode. But also, um, like, I think Elizabeth would feel absolutely terrible about the things she did, um, or, like, the things Phoebus did through her. Um, we are seated a little bit with um, Cole. You see, I'm trying to move us away a little bit from the wet rant. <laughs> I hope that's okay. Yeah, it's good. Um, uh, that she's very apologetic right away. And um, I think mm, there's like, Rowan was shot. And I think she feels terrible about that. And she's definitely going to visit him in the infirmary and like, look after him and like, probably try to explain, although she has nothing to explain. Um, and all that. And I think like in my Taylor Beth, brain is definitely that Taylor and Elizabeth have to talk this through and probably Elizabeth is going to Taylor for like emotional support after this like trying to rip her head around it and like telling her how what what it did to her giving or hearing her hearing Phoebus give those commands and um like seeing Taylor struggle and all that so yeah, I, I I like the what this episode potentially sets up for like headcans or fanfic, at least for me. That's fair. I just yeah. have um like three rapid fire, uh, really quick things. One thing I wanted to say was, hey, Lauren. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Lauren made another little reappearance and. He didn't do a lot, but again, anytime you just see Lauren, it's like Zelenka. It's like, oh, okay, it just elevates the episode. And it's just so nice to just see him and, um, like his little talk with Taylor at the end. I don't know, he says something. And I was like, okay. Um, I know Taylor and Lauren is a ship. Oh, yeah. And you know what? I don't hate it. I don't hate it. He would treat her right, and that's kind of what I love. I also think that he would just be happy being like her. Like yeah, you're the you're the queen. I'm just like yeah. your bodyguard. Yeah. You're a great like bodyguard at you. Oh yeah. He yeah. kinda gives that energy with Elizabeth too, like boss. Yeah. You know? So I feel like you yeah, carry yeah. over in that relationship for sure. Yeah. And yeah. If he's straight in whatever universe we're talking about, um, he likes women in power. Yeah. If he's not, yeah. he's obviously with Parrish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So it just depends on what, what what vibe you're feeling, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Second, I was going to say, gotta say, it's really refreshing to see Carson doing some actual medical work. Yeah! <laughs> it's very rare to see him, like, actually, like, in the middle of surgery or just, like, actually, you know, putting on the, the scrubs and, like, you know, telling everyone, you know, the gloves. Um, I honestly forgot. I'm not gonna, I don't know why I feel like I forgot he was a doctor. <laughs> but he's supposed to help people. Um, when he did start helping Ronan, I was like, oh yeah, I was like, this is your job. It's not like, like, you know, mad scientist. I forgot. 
And he's doing it in the dark, too, without any electricity. So it's, yeah. like, literally caveman style, which is crazy. Honestly, yeah. I wish we could have seen more of him, you know, just, I don't know, any scrubs or just doing more surgery stuff. I mean, I know it's not really a show for it, but just have him do some good. Um, <laughs> last thing as well, I feel like I just want to really quick bring up again the Rodney and John thing, because I think that's such an underrated relationship throughout this episode. Sorry, Rodney. Uh, John and Ronan. <laughs> uh, I love... Or no, not love. I mean, it's it's so heartbreaking that Ronan thinks that it's John in the beginning. And it's so easy for Thalen to just use some of John's vocabulary and convince Ronan that like he's on his side. And then when Elizabeth accidentally shoots Ronan and he's on the ground and he just looks so sad and confused and he's like, What? You're not you're not John? And the fact that Thalen really could have let um Ronan bleed out on the ground, but because of John's screaming maybe or because he just didn't care enough to like really he didn't feel like he needed to leave him there uh he calls the medical team and Ronan comes out but uh, disappears after the episode he's in surgery and that's it he doesn't get a little moment with John or Elizabeth either which is sad um but I just love I kind of love that Ronan just thought it was John it makes it so sad because he just loves John so much and I think he was just so willing, and he's too trusting, which is so, ah, uh, because he's only been here for, like, half a season, or, you know, a few, more than a few episodes, but, yeah. This shows their bond. Absolutely. How ro- how loyal Ronan is, and how John, like, almost commands that loyalty from everybody that um, is in the team, for sure. So... That brings this long episode <laughs> to us almost close. Because uh, for now, we are going to Ash for the Bechdel test. Oh, yeah. I actually had to go back and look it up because I couldn't tell during the episode. Um, because there's some interaction between Taylor and Elizabeth, but I wasn't sure if it was all just about John. It wasn't. Victory! So this episode passes. Um, yeah. And it's a like, one point I mentioned earlier when um, Taylor kind of appeals to like Phoebe's like humanism and like hey maybe don't do this and yeah so yay nice yay and we're actually gonna just stay with Ash because she has all the behind the scenes stuff I do first of in other languages this episode is mostly the same even in German but in French it's possessed ooh so, the title of this episode is an homage to Raymond Chandler's novel, The Long Goodbye, which is, which has also inspired a similarly named episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Oh. Um, McKay angrily calls, uh, Caldwell's teams Space Marines, uh, which is a reference to Warhammer 40,000. It's the most popular miniature war game in the world, according to Wikipedia. Nerd. Near the end of the episode, Shepard is seen using a pocket PC. Um, this device appears to be the HP iPack 5555, and it's the same model that they use for the life sign de- uh, detector prop. Oh. I was like, what was he doing? Like, his little stylus, like, clicking on the thing. I was like, he should have just had a Game Boy. I was like, what the hell is that? Um, <laughs> I was going to bring that up later, but what do you think he was doing? He was, well, that's why I was like, if it was a Game Boy, he would have been like just, you know, playing a little game. I was like, who are you texting right now? <laughs> <laughs> he was playing Solitaire. Oh, like John, <laughs> Joe was, <laughs> Joe was playing Solitaire when they set up the scene and he just continued doing that during the scene. <laughs> so. Stop. Stop. He's so funny for that. He was too into it. Yeah. Also, apparently that's Tori's uh, pocket computer, and she and Joe would fight over it on set. <laughs> that's very oh. Elizabeth John en- energy right there. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. It's so cute. It is really cute. 
The plot of this episode is similar to the one in the original Star Trek series, um, which is called Return to Tomorrow, uh, in which uh, the last three survivors, a married couple and a representative of, of their enemy, of a species, uh, wish to borrow the bodies of the Enterprise crewmen, Kirk, Spock, and, and Mulhall. They want to borrow their bodies until they can recreate android bodies for their consciousness to inhabit. This is complicated when the enemy entity inhabiting Spock's body tries to poison the one in Kirk's body and uh, therefore revives an old war. Rip, that is being based on like a Spurk thing. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> I don't remember that episode for some reason. I wonder why. Me neither. I had like a weird... I remember the married couple for some reason? That's it. Weird. Yeah. No idea. Huh. Yeah. I I have a few things from the audio commentary, which I think I mentioned earlier, is really cool and really I don't know, it's just really sweet and really relaxed. And it has Tori Higginson, I think Andy Mikita and another guy I forgot his name. So it has Tori as the an actor, Andy Mikita as a director. And then the third guy as director of photography. Mm. And it's it's really, it's a cool, I don't know, I really liked it. And they said that due to production issues towards the end of the season, this episode was really fragmented and also shot in a really fragmented way. Because usually they would shoot an episode of the course of seven days and then it was done and um, aired. But in this case, they shot it actually over the course of a whole month or even a bit longer. Whoa. So that meant that they sometimes shot scenes. But they shot scenes every here and there, like sometimes during lunch or in between other scenes or even after a long day of like shooting another episode. Oof. So, yeah. Is that real? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't. I mean, I don't fucking know. Um, it shouldn't. But I mean, it was in lunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. True. No, but I I thought it was very really interesting because it didn't feel to me that way in the episode. Like a lot was going on, but maybe that helped. It didn't feel fragmented to me, like in the end product. Yeah, I definitely feel like it was cohesive, even though um, a lot of things were happening in different parts of the city. So I guess it worked in its favor that. That's how the episode ended up coming out. Yeah, it was apparently it was sometimes a bit annoying because they had to go back and reshoot some scenes because they didn't work out. So it was, yeah, I think not the easiest episode to shoot. The actor who played Phoebus, so in the one scene where this old woman lays in the pond, but the actor who played her was apparently such an energetic person on set that her daughter who was with her on set because she was over 90 um had to calm her down a lot of times um because she was just entertaining the whole set with like her oh. personality i guess that is so amazing <laughs> yeah i mentioned this earlier but i think it deserves another mention it was actually tori herself so tori higginson herself who did the fight sequence um, with the security team and Tori thanked them that she was giving the given the trust to do all that. But they also said that she did a great job. So yeah, she was working close with um the stunt coordinator, I think James Bamford is his name. And yeah, I think that's really, really cool. There was another scene where they used a stunt double and it's when Elizabeth jumps down the what do you call it? The real? Yeah. And I mean, probably the director was really, really worried for her, um, for the stunt double, that she would hurt herself or whatever. And apparently the first time they shot this, he cut, uh, he yelled cut really, really early so she wouldn't jump. I think she still did it. Um, but Antonio said, also said that she was really worried that something would happen. But I mean, they're stunt people. Aren't they like, aren't they like precautions? But I thought it was really sweet that we'll, that they were so worried about her and their well-being. I wonder how high it was off the ground that they were, like, so yeah. concerned that she was jumping the ramp. Yeah. Yeah, because I was going to say, I, I feel like I saw, like, a behind-the-scenes thing one time, and that what they use for that, like, one corridor all the time is, like, an actual building. Oh. Like, 
So I think they had to always empty it out, I think, for Atlantis and have to decorate it. Or it's like, it was weird. It was like an entrance or like one of those just like a random like waiting area. So I can see them being a little worried because it, like, you know, it wasn't a set they built. It was generally just like a building. Um, yeah. So I feel like it probably was pretty tall. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe. It, it looks like it because I think we don't see it in this episode that much but there are like two floors and i think there are times where you can actually see both floors um so yeah nothing happened luckily so (laughs) tori found it emotionally jarring uh firing a gun which she hadn't done before but she got quickly used to it and at the end oh yeah there's a quote so quote at the end of the day i was like yeah give me that gun give me a bigger gun (laughs) like yeah Please give her a gun. Um, I don't like guns, but like on screen, it's fine. <laughs> exactly. Also, Tori said um, that this is, was by far one of her favorite episodes to shoot. For sure. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, a little goof. When John or Phelan shoots the door panel towards the end of the episode, um, you can clearly see an electrical charge stuck to the panel, which is about to blow up. Oops. So I went back and looked at it, and it's so it's I think it's white, and the door panel is like brown, red ish, and you just see like yeah, that doesn't belong there. <laughs> Oops. What I found um, when I was like looking at reviews or like talk about this episode is that. It's a very polarizing episode. So a lot of people who hate it or who skip it, and probably for very valid reasons, I think we pointed them out. Um, like there's a lot of reason to criticize this episode, but on the other hand, there are a lot of people who find it really enjoyable, like me, <laughs> and who who like it for that and think it's very good. Um, but yeah, I found it interesting because it's I don't know. I guess it makes sense. It's kind of a unique episode. Um, I guess. And it's a, like, it doesn't tie in with a lot of the episodes, so it's a kind of a standalone episode. But yeah, that's, that's it for me. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for all of that. Um, <laughs> let's head over now to four for the Fic Rec Corner. All right. So I initially had one rec for this episode. Uh, and then I added more because, of course, while we're having discussion, you guys inspire me. Um, so I added another two to the list. Um, unfortunately, I have not read very many thick, uh, episode tags for this episode. Um, so I'm, I'm, I don't have many that are directly related. I, was very inspired by the cold open of this episode and then my my fellow podcasters mentioning that they wanted Taylor and Ronan to be taken to Earth by John and Ronnie to learn all of the strange Earth things. And so I thought, why not? There is a subgenre of uh, Stargate Atlantis fic that is basically just road trip. Earth road trip. So I thought, why not wreck some, some of those fic? So the first one um, is a gen fic. It's called Roadside Attractions. Basically, uh, Taylor and Ronan are stuck under the mountain on their first visit or side. And so John, and by extension Rodney, uh, spring them from Cheyenne and they go to a Denny's and shenanigans happen. And it's very funny and cute and lovely and very team. So I highly recommend Everyone read it. Then there is a very similar fic to this. Uh, it's called 844,739 Ways to Eat a Hamburger. This is a very silly, bordering on cracktastic fic um, with background mixed up, but not really. Um, where everyone gets wasted. Then they have a hangover breakfast. It's very haha chuckles. Um, first trip, team trip, or side. Uh, fun times. Uh, another comedy. Something light and uplifting. Maybe after our, our, our ranting. <laughs> Go ahead and, and, uh, read those fic. Um, I also added this fic. Not sure how relatable it is to this 
um, episode, but I wanted to add it. Anyway, we sort of mentioned um, at the beginning John's sort of um, uh, inability to emote or his strange way of emoting. And um, I think, again, I mentioned the episode that sort of uh, the weird John dialogue hand in hand with Joe's weird delivery and acting and makes this amazing, funny, hilarious combination. So there's a fic, there was sort of this like fic trend that happened um, based on that, which is called the robot John fic trend where people like, were like, what if John is a robot? Uh, and I thought it was funny, so I'm just going to recommend one of the best ones, in my opinion. Um, it's called The Difference Engine by Copper Badge. He's written a bunch of Atlantis fic that's really good. He wrote uh, the Ronin Becoming Canadian one, which is great. Um, yeah, so basically, Shepard had died in Afghanistan. And, um, John, um, still goes to Atlantis because Rodney and Carson, um, were part of this project that mixed artificial intelligence with biology. And they might have had a little bit to do with John surviving, um, the war so he could go to Atlantis. Uh, anyway, it's really interesting. I like the way, um... It's written, the dialogue is fun, and it kind of explores this idea of John being a weirdo man who is weird about emotions. So, yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> Whoa. Oh my gosh. Tor gave us, like, a buffet table of sort of, like, themes and, like, characters and relationships to pick from. So, yay! Thank you. Of course, the fix will be listed in the description box. And of course, you can always check out our Google Doc, which is in our link tree and everything. Um, and that has a, the full list of every fic we've ever recommended so far. And one last thing before we head over to our ratings, I just want to give a little poll shout out. Uh, so we did a poll uh, about our on critical mass. And the question was, what were Kavanaugh's encrypted messages about? <laughs> and everyone said, unsolicited dick pics. <laughs> <laughs> so that settles that. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'm scandalized. I to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and now we can head over to rating for this episode. <laughs> Who want to go first? <laughs> yeah, I can go first. I feel like mine's easiest. <laughs> um, okay, so... I'm scared. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Listen, listen, listen. I have not been favorable on these last few episodes, and it's not going to get any better, unfortunately, seeing these episodes that are, you know, upcoming. Um, however, if you get something out of this episode, more power to you. I wish you the best. It just didn't work for me. Absolutely. I don't want to say I wish I liked it, but <laughs> it's an episode, uh, so I think I'm being very generous when I say I give it a six. Wow. I think I'm being, honestly, maybe I'm being too generous. I don't know. It's fall. I'm feeling, I'm feeling all Christ the Christmas spirit is coming. Um, so <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at a, at a six. Ash, what do you think? Oh, it's... Okay, so, do I think it's a good episode? I don't know. Am I annoyed by a lot of things, like the Caldwell thing, the Taylor thing, the Taylor and John thing? Yes! Do you still love, love this episode? Yes. <laughs> so I think it did everything for me that it didn't do for you, Sam. Um. So, I think I have... No, I think I'm giving it a 10 out of 10 just for enjoyment, because I was having such a good time watching it. I think it's funny. It gives us badass women, like Corey. Um, it has Rodney saving the day in the end. We get Taylor and Elizabeth crumbs and, like, hints and all that. It, what I mentioned earlier, the whole potential for, like, the whole her comfort and, like, emotional, like, aftermath, which I love. 
um, is there. Um, and I, I just love all that. So, yep. I feel after our discussion, there's a lot of, like, I can see that there's a lot of to criticize about this episode. And I think it's all valid. And I think especially if you look at it in the bigger picture, because Again, Sam, what you mentioned a lot of things with, with Taylor, um, that Elizabeth, it, that this episode does nothing for Elizabeth and all that. So I think in the picture of all that, it's, it changes things, I think, for me. But like, I, I'm curious how I feel about this episode next time I watch it. I think I will still enjoy it, but maybe I will be a bit more like aware of like everything that's happening. Yeah. Right. So for me, it's hard because I feel like I enjoy this episode um, on the surface. Like, it's so fun. Like, it's fun to hate Caldwell. It's fun to <laughs> to um, to watch Elizabeth S. Phoebus kick ass. Uh, it was funny to me. It was very comedic in terms of, like, slapstick and, like, funny, um, horrible marriage jokes. Um... <laughs> So I enjoyed all that, although I did, um, of course, have the same problems that you both had with, um, you know, how we treat our female characters and and how I feel like John takes too much of a focus in a lot of episodes and need to give that focus to other characters, especially if we're saying that our show has an ensemble cast. So I don't know. I feel like I would read it. I don't know. Like you can go in between. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> I'll do the in between. <laughs> well, if it helps, if it helps, I was gonna say I'm gonna move my score down to a five. <laughs> oh, because because I was thinking about it and I was like, can I like if five is the middle ground? I was like, can I put that above it? No. Hmm. And I oh, think okay. five is middle. Five is average. So mm-hmm. I think if you like go seven, that's yeah. or not. You know, I'm not telling you to go seven, but like <laughs> seven. You know, to make it easier, so it's not like a seven point five. I'll just go five, so you can go. Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So five, Sam, Evan, Tor, ten, Ash. Damn. <laughs> yeah. We're getting more and more divided, I feel like, in this season two. Yeah. Like and for some ratings. reason, I'm always in the middle. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. True, yeah. They're, like, harshly grading it. <laughs> and Ash is always like, I liked it. And then Tor is like, uh, I see both. <laughs> yeah, but that's the best thing about this podcast. You come to the podcast for the gay jokes and all, like, the funny stuff. But no, you stay. For Ash's enthusiasm and optimism, Tor's like genuine thoughts, and also just the perfect negotiator, <laughs> like the middle ground, and seeing both, and you come from my pessimistic, God damn it, I wish this was better, thoughts, <laughs> and long yeah. rants. <laughs> yeah, definitely for your rants. Yeah. yeah, so that's just what you get with this podcast. You get the yeah. best of both worlds. Yeah. Anyways, thank you for joining us again on this super long episode. Who knew this was going to be so long of the Jumping Puddles podcast? Again, be sure to check out everything linked down in the description below. We have our fanfic recommendations. You can also vote on polls if you're on Spotify. Um, you can also follow our German Pedals podcast accounts to see when we are dropping new episodes. And you could also follow our personal accounts to see what we're up to and what shows we are talking about. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Bye. Bye. All right, you clowns, listen up. I don't often get a chance to say this, so savor it. Good work, boys and girls. Let's go home.